Another example was of this SS St. Louis. 900 and more Jews got on a ship in Hamburg, Germany, because after the, the council at Evian had asserted that there was, uh, uh, okay, we know that there's a quota following the American pattern of quotas, limiting the number of people who are allowed, and there were so many people fleeing that uh, a big question was raised, should we increase the quota? And at the Council at Evian, 30 of the 31 nations there said no increase in the quota. One country, the Dominican Republic, slightly increased, but mostly said no. Well, they thought they had a chance in Cuba, and by the time they got to Cuba, they found that it was a, a vanished chance. So then they went to Havana, I mean to Hawaii, to, I'm sorry, to Miami Harbor, where there were a lot of Jewish friends and relatives who were very eager to take them in and, and account for them, help them get uh, reestablished, make them part of the defense against the oncoming onslaught. But no, they were turned away because, as Franklin Delano Roosevelt put it, the quota is full. And so they were returned to Antwerp, where over 700 of them perished in the concentration camps. Was C also responsible for what happened to B? I say yes. Preventing escape is collaboration with tyranny. And as a matter of fact, after that, the Nazis considered it a green light to do whatever to, they wanted to the Jews because the rest of the world didn't really care either. At the same time that people like uh, Franklin Roosevelt said the quota is full, even at that time, they were turning away people with polio, for example, saying, well, you know, we're not sure that you can take care of yourself. President Roosevelt himself was a person who had polio and was quite capable of taking care of himself and accomplishing a good job. But there were other people who defied the law. Chiyune Shinohara wrote the visas for thousands, tens of thousands, of uh, fleeing Jews fleeing Lithuania and sent them off to Japan and to China where they were accepted, even though he was defying the orders of his authority in, in uh, Japan. And of course, everyone knows of uh, Oskar Schindler, very few people know about the recent book that came out talking about the Albanian Muslims who saved Jews in uh, World War II. And you know, a lot of times forget that those people were <coughs> potentially enormously beneficial to the defense against tyranny in other countries. As we've expected from, as we found that there were uh, Jewish immigrants who became part of the of the in military and intellectual fabric of defense against tyranny. Even Ayn Rand only barely escaped being sent back to, uh, to Russia because she married Frank O'Connor. And it's even questioned whether they were truly married or whether it was a marriage of convenience for, for satisfying the officials. Well, not everyone had those chances. How about the Cuban refugees? Not too long ago in 1993, the HMS Royal Majesty was fined $3,000 per person that they rescued at sea fleeing Castro's Cuba. He said he would do it again, and he did do it again. He was fined a total of $57,000, that captain. But most of the other ships then learned their lesson and looked the other way, ignoring the, the, the people fleeing. I admire them so much. They take such harrowing risks. The people going across the, 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 um, the Bermuda, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the straits there between uh, Cuba and, and, and Florida, or Haiti and Florida. They risk sharks and exposure and pirates, storms. Maybe a third of them don't even make it. And yet they do so. Extraordinary case of liberty, give me liberty or give me death. And yet the United States find them in violation of international law that requires cruise ships to pick them up. But people would just as soon ignore that. It was a convenient and easy thing to do. Was C also responsible for what happened to B? I say yes. In preventing escape, it is collaboration with tyranny. I mean, that's what Fidel Castro depends on. Assistance in preventing from people from fleeing, just as, fleeing as, just as um, as it would have been had the Iron Curtain been treated in the same way. If people had tried to flee and were just sent back, nothing would have pleased the, um, the, uh, the tyrants of Russia better. What about this objection here, that uh, immigrants are stealing our jobs and polluting our culture? And I say that the root of this is a xenophobia, and it contrasts fear and courage. Now, people genuinely don't feel threatened by newborn infants. 
but they're, you know, they, they don't know the language, they don't know the culture, they don't know the customs, they have to be, they're really dependent for, uh, you know, a couple decades before they can really be self-sustaining and so on. But people are threatened by uh, immigrants. They're not infants for the most part. For the most part, they're, they're young, vital adults capable of taking care of themselves. I, I was conducting a class one time and this man came in to clean the garbage out late at night on a, an evening class. And I asked him, I, well, you know, we're talking about immigration here. Where are you from? He said, well, I'm from the Philippines. And I said, well, what did you do in the Philippines before you came here and uh, were a custodian here at the school? And he says, well, I was a professor of political science at my university. I wondered, uh, would I be willing to do the same kinds of changes in my life if my family's life and, and, and my own uh, life were dependent on it? Well, courage welcomes competition. Fear shuts it out. Courage embraces the newcomer. Fear expels the newcomer. Courage champions liberty. Fear denies it. As it has done so often where there were cultural differences. Now, this hit hard over the years, always a new group of outsiders that seemed to be a very serious threat. The Irish, oh, they're horrible, they're, they're papists. The blacks, you know, they're, they're, they're of a strange color and strange customs. The Germans, can't allow them in. They may side with the wrong side in the war. The Chinese, the Italians, the Catholics, the Mormons, the Jews the East Europeans, the Hispanics, and now the Muslims. Ayn Rand, I think, characterized it best. Racism is the lowest, most crudely primitive form of collectivism, describing to each and every person, I mean, to, to a whole mass of people, a prejudice against the mass rather than considering each and every individual for themselves, their own mind, their own reason, their own abilities. We've had a long history of people, of course, coming and feeling the hardship in the early immigration, but then later feeling rather mm, snobbish towards the, uh, towards the others. And not realizing, in a sense, that everybody comes from immigrants who came from elsewhere. Even the narrative Native American Indians came in various waves uh, that uh, uh, preceded uh, the European uh, movement to America. Probably the most uh, concrete form of this, uh, of this kind of racism was exhibited during, in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act, where it was said that the Chinese threatened filth, immorality, disease, and most importantly, they threatened white labor. They took on the work that was, they were asked to do to, to build the highway, the railroads across the United States. They were the first... Uh, uh, to come in and uh, they, uh, contract laborers went out to, to, to China and signed them up saying come on and work and build these, these great railroads that are going to be built across the country. And they signed up because conditions were very, very bad where they were coming from. And they took on the work that was too difficult, too dangerous, too dirty, or at a time that was too dark that Americans didn't want to do. And how was the American response at the time? Not all Americans, but some Americans, those especially who felt fearful, decided, well, we'll just outlaw them. Fortunately, some refugees are now allowed from China. I mean, uh, France enjoys the uh, citizenship now of Yo-Yo Ma, who escaped uh, the communist China and is a, a marvelous uh, cellist. I.M. Pei, who has uh, pr produced the, the extension of the Louvre uh, Museum. Um, I also have to put this picture of my wife up here because <laughs> with, without the acceptance of Chinese, I would not have been able to find her. That's a long and interesting story. But there are so, you know, there, there, there's property that belongs to people who don't want immigrants, and there's property that belongs to people who do want immigrants, and then there's a lot of other property that's government property. Now, if you don't want to have immigrants into your property, I believe you have an absolute right to exclude anybody that you want for whatever reason. It's your property. But a lot of times, these people say, well, what we want to do is to assume that all government property, about a third of the United States, is their property too. It's a kind of eminent domain, assertion by political power that it's to be treated as if it was ours. And so then we're going to exclude the Chinese. We're going to exclude whomever we want because of their, of their race. 
Well, I would say, of course, the far better solution is to privatize that government property. Let it be homesteaded or auctioned off or, um, so that people can decide for themselves whether they want to accept or not. But it does not, uh, that it, it's an error to assume that the, um, that the government property can be used as a way of denying freedom, especially in a country such as the United States. Suppose that you're an employer. And you have two people standing in front of you, and you don't know much about them. You only know that one is a, a native applicant for the job, from whatever country you're from, and the other one is an immigrant applicant for the job. Okay. Now, just by a show of hands, how many would say that, the, that you would expect that the native applicant for the job would be more likely the harder worker of the two? How many would say that, well, if you had only that to go by, you might assume that the immigrant might be the harder worker of the two? Raise your hand if you think so. Well, a lot of times people uh, recognize that immigrants are very hard workers. And it's not because people in other countries are harder worker than in your country. It's that immigrants are very self-selecting. They are already people who have shown a huge amount of courage and diligence and uh, willingness to take on tasks despite ho the, the potential for hostility. So there's something that's very self-selecting about immigrants. And, but regardless of whether you think, whether you want to hire an immigrant or not, you should be able to choose, if you're the employer and you own your property and you're, it's yours to give to whom you choose, it's your decision. It isn't the decision of the government that you must choose the native or that you must choose the applicant. You have the right to choose. As Robert Trzinski says of the Ayn Rand Institute, the irrational premise behind our nation's immigration laws is that a native-born American has a right to a particular job, not because he has earned it, but because he was born here. To this right, the law sacrifices the employer's right to hire the best employees and the immigrant's right to take a job that he deserves. Now, there's a, an assertion here by the native applicant that he has a right to pass a law or to, to do something to prevent this. Well, now this person doesn't have a right to do this by themselves. They don't have a right to intervene and, and do harm to the employer to put them in a cage and along with this immigrant employee. Um, it is immoral to initiate a force against others. Of course, this is a very easy thing for me to say among a group of libertarians. You've heard it before and it's not, not tough to do. Similarly, if that person doesn't have the right, he doesn't have the right to ask another person to do it for him. It's just asking a politician or a police officer to do the dirty work. If he doesn't have a right to do it, he can't ask somebody else to do it for him. And the criminal act is in using force against the employer and his or her choice of employee. To me, it's considered, uh, I consider it a very, very uh, immoral thing to take a person who wants to hire and a person who wants to work and to put them in jail for it uh, because of that action. This, um, I, the right to choose is a property right of the employer. And the employer may choose on the basis not of hard work, but may, uh, may be on the basis of money. But it isn't because you know, he, he's trying to do harm to this native applicant. He has to, he's facing a world of competition where the motive then, if he doesn't get the best at the best price, then he may have to move abroad. Or he may have to, or, or the customers will buy products that are made abroad at an even lower price. Well, whatever the, uh, the freedom of choice is, provides the best uh, solution, I think, it's the, it's the most humane, the most practical, and the most ethical overall. But then people say, well, we can't allow immigration so long as there is the welfare state. For the most part, immigrants are thought to be people who only come because there are free goodies. Of course, not free jobs, they have to work hard for that, but free health care, free education, all kinds of goodies. So we can't allow uh, immigration until we eliminate the, free, the welfare state, which in essence is trying to say, is almost like saying, well, um, that's not likely to happen, so we don't really ever have to think about immigrants. My evidence, my research shows that really this is a, a false argument. If you take the top welfare, w consider, suppose that these immigrants come into the country, then they could go freely to any country that offers the most welfare. Well, of course, they're not eligible legally for the welfare, but there are a number of benefits that they could get at the hospitals or education and so on like that. But just suppose that they, uh, they come into the country and if they were going for welfare, 
you would think that they would go to the place where they offered the most welfare. And every state is different. Some, offer, some states offer a lot more welfare than, than others. Uh, Hawaii is the top on the list. In the 1990s, it was offering uh, welfare benefits. Just from the six major programs that are offered consistently around the country, uh, you'd have to, uh, the average hourly wage equivalent of that welfare would be about $17.80. Um, but it turns out that all of those states that had high degrees of welfare had net domestic outmigration. Both of the native-born population and the foreign-born population left throughout the decade of the 1990s. And um, as a matter of fact, Hawaii was the one state out of the country that had uh, a decline in its population. Um, uh, in, and the bottom 10 welfare states, the ones with the least amount of welfare, had the most gain. And that's because I believe that everyone, I'm not, not, of course there are some exceptions, some people do go for the welfare, but most people go where there are opportunities, and the opportunities are greater where the taxes are lower to support uh, less in the way of welfare. My proposition is this, voluntary giving is moral, involuntary giving is not. It is not ethical to prohibit a moral human action, a flight to freedom and productive work, based on an immoral action, which is theft. So, for example, if you look at the case here of the politician taking money from the taxpayer by force to give to a welfare recipient, the immoral action here, in my opinion, is that of the politician. And what's more, he compounds his crime, not only by forcing the taxpayer to pay for somebody else who may not be productive or may, he may not choose to give to, but then using that as a, as a means of control over other people. You know, how many children you can have, what you could eat. I mean, consider the fact that uh, because the government subsidizes the mail delivery in each of our countries, could they tell us how many letters we can deliver? We wouldn't ex accept that. And yet, a lot of people say, well, because they might give welfare to immigrants, we can uh, deport the immigrant. Well, it's just as logical to say that you should deport the native welfare recipient. But this misses the point. These are not the ones who created this situation. Sure, they're receiving it, as everyone, many people do, receive benefits from government in a variety of ways, but I consider that the real criminal here is the politician. If you want to deport anybody, deport the politician. <laughs> but they say, well, but you know, this, uh, this sets up a system where it's supporting a, a cultural behavior that, that you might consider um, abhorrent or different than, than your own cultural system. Uh, for example, the immigrant welfare recipient from China or, from the, or from, the, uh, from the Mormon population of the 1930s or from, uh, um, uh, or from, uh, or others. Well, at any rate, these are the ones. Uh, suppose that they, they might have four wives and so they might qualify, qualify for more benefits. That they're here again. The problem, the, the problem here isn't that, that they're qualified for too much. It's that the government has no business getting into cultural definitions anyway. The purpose of law is to protect individual rights and has no business giving uh, uh, money to either of these welfare recipients and um, because the, the, the purpose of law is to protect individual rights, not to impose cult collective cultural values. People are the ultimate resource. Free people improve life for all is my proposition. And the one who demonstrates this the best is Julian Simon in his fab fabulous work, especially his book, The Ultimate Resource, talking about people. And this chart shows uh, the per capita GDP of two countries, the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, from 1500 to 2000. And there's been a, an astounding increase in wealth. And population didn't stand in the way of that. Population was the reason for it. There were 66 million immigrants that came to the United States. And it didn't stop America from growing. It what helped America to grow. Julian Simon not only surveyed economists and found them almost universally agreed that, that immigrants provide extraordinary benefits to a nation. But he also, according to Simon, most immigrants come when they are in their most productive years. Overall, new immigrants average only one year less in education than the native population of the U.S., but their children are highly motivated and excel beyond the level of Native Americans in school. Immigrants have a higher proportion of advanced degrees in, than the native population, especially in high productivity areas of science and engineering. Immigrants to the U.S., even those from poor countries, says Simon, are healthier in general than natives of the same age 
um, in, in the United States. Family cohesion with a tradition of hard work is stronger than, American, than among natives. Simon also reports on 14 separate studies concluding that immigrants do not cause native unemployment even among very sensitive categories of low-paid, minority, low-skilled, or even high-skilled groups of natives. <laughs> Another 12 studies reveal that immigrants do not have a negative effect on wages. There is no fixed number of jobs. Entering immigrants, enterprising immigrants, come with arms, legs, and brains that create employment and wealth. Wherever they settle, those who have little education have traditionally had the motivation to take on the four Ds of work that is either too difficult, too dangerous, too dirty, or too dark for most American workers to want to do. Simon concluded from a review of the research that when they are not prohibited from working by anti-labor laws, immigrants contribute more in taxes than they draw out from the government welfare services. And over the years, immigrant earnings exceed the earnings of comparable native groups. Julian Simon, Simon asserted that the continuation of welfare benefits for aging citizens, especially where most, pop, most of the developed countries have uh, declining population, uh, the, 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 even the continuation of the benefits for these uh, people may well depend on the contributions of youthful immigrants. If this is so, then why aren't immigrants the world over treated as the treasures of the earth? Why aren't politicians the world over competing with each other to lure these valuable human resources to their land in the same manner that they would compete to lure the products of all this human labor such as things that they trade for. Why, why, do they, why don't they value people more than oil even? Certainly a person is more valuable and, and has a great deal more potential than a barrel of oil. Surely human beings are the ultimate resource. As been demonstrated in Silicon Valley, where as, a, as many as a third of the businesses there were founded or co-founded by immigrants. Intel, eBay, Yahoo, all of these. Many of these companies now the high-tech companies around the world are trying to apply for these H-1B visas to get more uh, bright minds from all over the world to come to the United States. And on average, they get about 20% of the visa applications approved. The government turns down another 80%, much to the loss of the United States and even to their home countries because very often they go back to their home countries with the greater skills and knowledge and wealth. But there is a kind of political intervention that increases emigration from other countries. It's a kind of, you might say, well, a kind of other kind of welfare, what I call corporate protectionism in the form of trade barriers, a kind of tyrant welfare known as foreign aid, and especially the military aid, and I think the drug war as well. Protectionism is corporate welfare. The world market price for sugar might be five cents a pound, and, but Americans have to pay 20 cents a pound domestically, four times as much for the sugar. And the government even pays farmers to destroy sugar in order to keep those prices high. The Europeans do this on an even bigger scale. Well, I consider this egregious. The Economist magazine says, if rich countries were to remove the subsidies to agriculture alone, the poor countries would benefit by more than three times the amount of all the overseas development assistance they receive each year. And I'd say it's far beyond that because the development assistance is all too often conscience money that goes from poor people in rich countries and goes to, um, it takes, is taken from poor people in rich countries and given to rich people in, in poor countries. And doing a lot of harm in the way. The U.S. taxpayer has been compelled to provide uh, for tyrant welfare to, to an extremely sordid gang of thugs over for the decades. Even to guys that the United States then, decades later, then turns around and has to fight it, or feels that it has to fight it. I'd say the drug war has also led to an extraordinary corruption abroad, as is currently being evidenced in Mexico and Colombia and most of South, South America. No action by rich countries has done more to contribute to the poverty, corruption, and carnage in the third world than the drug war, in my opinion. It is a perverse policy because of the extraordinary waste of human resources and the enrichment of criminal elements both inside and outside governing circles. But another objection is, well, immigrants are terrorists. They're determined to kill us. And it's true, some, <coughs> some did attack. Some were terrorists and they were very, very criminal elements. 
Now, this has certainly commanded a lot of attention since the 9-11 a terrorist attack on the World Trade Center. Some have even cried for an end to immigration as a means of keeping terrorists far away. Every ship, barge, and airplane is viewed as a, a kind of Trojan horse. Now, to the extent the government has any legitimate function, it is to protect the people from conquering invasion. It would be intelligent, it should be intelligent enough to figure this out. I have no problem with denying visas to an invading army, though I suspect that if the North Korean government gave orders to invade the United States in this manner, virtually every starving soldier would become a defector the instant he crossed the border. Now, it is understandable that in the aftermath of such crisis as the 9-11, people will and must clamor for protective measures against terrorists, but reason must prevail over collectivist repression in order to gain real protection. Indeed, immigrants may be essential to a nation's security as well. The U.S. government has no shortage of defense expenditures, spending more than the rest of the world combined, far more. Nevertheless, the U.S. intelligence uh, security agencies, despite the abundance of wealth, personnel, and technology at their disposal, came up short in a decades-long effort to root out a terrorist network with global tentacles which originated in some of the poorest nations of the world. The villains had long said they wanted to attack on America. The villains had attempted attacks before on the World Trade Center, even on the same targets. The villains are reported to have been within the U.S. government's grasp on earlier, er, earlier occasions, but they were not pursued. I would say that was just bad job at law enforcement. And there is no shortage of hate crimes around the world. Um, there's hate crimes everywhere. There's a lot of hate crime, not just started from uh, Muslims, but there's hate crimes from a variety of groups, Ku Klux Klan and the, uh, the uh, skinheads and uh, uh, white supremacist groups, to, to name just a few. One of these was a guy named Timothy McVeigh. Now, he, he perpetrated the worst crime, the worst crime of terrorism per capita, meaning for himself, the numbers of people he killed was greater than any other terrorist crime in the United States history. He blew, blew up the, the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. Now, I think that it was a good job to try and, and prosecute the people who are guilty for this, even to prevent that. But to hold the... Yeah, he came from New York to conduct this crime. Would it have made sense to put a wall around New York and hold all the people of New York as responsible for this crime because yes. Timothy McVeigh came. <laughs> okay, there is an argument. <laughs> Others say there isn't enough space for immigrants. Well, I argued that there is plenty of space. Especially when you fly for hours and hours over the countryside and you find vast expanses of land, you find tremendous amount of land area. People live in cities because they like cities. They go to the crowded areas, even the environmentalists go to the crowded areas to live because that's where the action is, that's where the employment is, that's where the connections are, that's where the families are, that's where people like to live. They have for centuries been moving increasingly towards the cities in the 20th century, the 21st century are no, no exceptions. About 3% of all the land area of the United States is cities and suburbs, 97% is countryside. And uh, now you might say that some of it may be inhospitable like uh, the desert. But then you find uh, you know, places like um, uh, Las Vegas here in the bottom picture here uh, that becomes an oasis of tremendous prosperity because of one thing they allowed, freedom for gambling and prostitution and other things like that. Now, you may not like those things. You don't have to go there. But the number one destination for the people of Hawaii, when they travel to the mainland, the number one destination overwhelmingly, hands down, is to Las Vegas. And they, they don't go to open spaces. They go to the crowded casinos. And that's true, really, of people from uh, the rest of the country as well. Now, this uh, map shows uh, roughly where the government owns land. It owns about a third of the land. And this shows the, where people live. Now, there's a lot of open space. And look, California, California and, New and New York, the states, both of those states in the 1990s lost population. They had an outpouring of population, less population. But... There were more people in New York City and in New York City and in Los Angeles, the metropolitan area. So there's more of both if you want. There's more crowded space in the, in the cities if you like, and that's what people do like. And there's more open space if you want it, especially if you're in a country with declining population, as most all of the industrial countries of the world would be having a uh, declining population without, um, uh, without immigration. And people underestimate the, the potential for immigrants. Immigrants such as those in Hong Kong 
uh, created one of the most pro prosperous countries in the world. They went in a, inside of 50 years from being one of the poorest countries in the world per capita to being one of the richest, even richer than the United Kingdom now, about a per capita basis, uh, their former colonial uh, empire, uh, ruler. And, uh, and still, 40% of Hong Kong is zoned country park where nobody's allowed to live. Now, I did a little calculation. I found that you, you could, you know, Hawaii, the, the people are allowed to live on, it's zoned for commercial and residential use, only 4% of the land area of the, all of the Hawaiian Islands. Now, we're just a little island out in the Pacific, but people think, oh, you're crowded. Well, no, we're not crowded. We've got lots and lots of space. We're only allowed to live on 4% of the land area. And, um, well, if the people were willing to, you could accommodate all the refugees in the world I mean, if they were willing to accept just one-third of the population densities of, uh, of Hong Kong, they could still have 40% of the land area country park, and they would have um, uh, accommodated all 30 million, or what are estimated the 30 million, both internal and external refugees around the world. I mean, they, these are, um, well, we can go into a whole lot of these other things. But a lot of people say, but strong walls build good neighbors. And my wife uh, kind of laughs at that. She says, you know, she teaches uh, ch Chinese history. And she's talking about, uh, you know, there were old walls. She says the, the Great Wall of China was the world's biggest graveyard. How many thousands, of, hundreds of thousands of people were buried there in building it or in, in uh, maintaining it, and, uh, and the world's greatest failure. She said it never stopped anyone from coming. It gave a false sense of security and misdirected the attention of the rulers from the things that didn't matter. And, and uh, from the things that mattered to the things that didn't matter. So tearing down walls builds a rationale for good behavior, I think. But we have deadly new walls being built in the United States. There's the, uh, at a $4 billion cost, they're planning a wall across the, the southern border of, uh, across Mexico. They're not putting it on across the one in, uh, north of, of, for Canada. And um, it's making it harder for immigrants to, to come. They go further out in the desert to, to places where now, since 9-11, more people have died out in the desert trying to enter the country than were killed at 9-11 in the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. I mean, it's a, it's a ghastly um, cemetery in a sense, that it's unnecessary. There was, in fact, a recent guy named Walt Staten who was, who was prosecuted because he and a group of people uh, saying uh, their the group was called No More Deaths. They, they carried water out to certain places in the desert where they knew that the immigrants were going. And they essentially created an oasis for them by planting bottles of water so they wouldn't die of thirst out there, as so many had done. And they were arrested and convicted for littering. <laughs> the thing that was tragic about this is that when this was announced, the, 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 the station was flooded with a lot of twittering calls from people saying, great! got to stop those people who are helping immigrants. I find that tragic from a nation that considers itself a religious nation, uh, bent on caring for other people, doing to unto others as you would have them do unto you. Penn and Teller actually put a funny light onto this. Penn and Teller run a, um, a TV show on, on Showtime, and they said, OK, let's see how effective this wall will be. And they went out and did what the government did. They hired a bunch of illegal immigrants to build the wall, which is exactly what the government was doing. And they, uh, <laughs> they built a wall to specification, so it would be exactly like the wall that the government is building. And then they gave them a contest. They split them up into three groups to see which group could get to the other side of the wall fastest, going over the wall, going through the wall, or under the wall. All three groups got to the other side of the wall in less than three minutes. Not a very effective thing, but a huge boon for the builders, the con contractors who are building this wall. Lastly, I have to give great um, appreciation to my hosts here from France. The people of France contributed a remarkable gift to the people of America. They were recognizing that America represented something new in the 19th century. It was an, uh, an oasis for people who were fleeing religious, economic, and uh, political uh, tyranny. In recognition of the 100-year centennial, they gathered voluntary contributions from the people of France 
to put together this uh, Statue de Liberté, and I think it was a, a great, great symbol. It's a great symbol that I think that libertarians uh, still, still should find a great deal of inspiration from. Now, I wish to say, in the strongest words that I can muster, emboldened by the courage and fortitude of immigrants throughout the world and throughout history, that people who have, have earned admiration and grat that these immigrants are people who have earned admiration and gratitude rather than scorn, we should be grateful for what they've contributed and what they continue to contribute and offer rather than to look down our noses and treat them like dirt. That we should not be devising schemes and rationalizations for, this, for the restriction of liberty. Rather, let us take part in the fight against fear, prejudice, custom, and law to champion freedom. This is practical, it is humanitarian, and above all, it is ethical. Let us be a part of the drive for liberty today. Let us champion the millions of immigrants who are seeking liberty in the same manner that we would do if we were in their shoes. Thank you.